Hello and welcome to This Board Game Life episode number 19, Gen Con 2012 part 1, Top Most Surprisingly Good Games. This is the show where we talk about this fantastic board gaming hobby of ours through the views and outlooks of two gamers, one a seasoned veteran and the other a fresh handsome face to the hobby. Hey my name's Rob. My name is Rob and today I've got my co-host cohort Jeff that's you that's your cue yeah okay yeah your overly <laughs> negative jaded and joyless co-host jeff don't forget snob snob yeah snobby co-host, co-host snob yes so you're a co-host cohort snob <laughs> yes that's so me. so uh have you been recovered fully recovered yet jeff I'm still in the Gen Con 2012 mo- mode. I'm still, uh. Oh, you're tired. You got like blurry vision. Actually, you're dehydrated. I don't know that I was ever all that tired. I feel like I got, um, if, if we got, whether it was three, four, or five hours of sleep each night, I think that was three, four, or five hours more than pretty much anyone else I saw. So <laughs> okay, I think yeah. we, I think we were doing pretty good on sleep, all things considered. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Very true. So for those of you that haven't uh, picked up on what we're talking about here, uh, last week, Jeff and I made the big trek down to that city known as Indianapolis, where we attended Gen Con 2012. So, you know, being in Chicago, we're not that far. It was what, like a three and a half hour drive? Yeah. And we, uh, yeah, well, we, it's an hour later there for some strange, odd reason. Yeah. That whole time zone business. Four and a half hours there and only two and a half hours back. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> that yeah, that is true. <laughs> Extra hour there, and you two hours. Yeah, how's that work? It's two it's and a half hours travel. quicker. It's come time back travel, out. man. And it literally is central to eastern. So yeah, Jeff and I uh, went out there last Wednesday. We uh, attended the the big gaming soiree from what Thursday through Sunday. There was so much stuff to see. We had a great time. Not enough sleep uh, to be had, but hey, gaming, gaming, gaming. That's what it's all about, right? Yep, absolutely. Now, uh, this was your first Gen Con, right? Oh, yeah. The first and hopefully not the last. You know, I, I had a buddy who's been, well, he used to go a lot, maybe like uh, 10 years ago or more back when it was in Milwaukee. So I used to hear lots and lots and lots of stuff about it. And, you know, back in the day, I used to be pretty heavy into Dungeons and Dragons. So, you know, back at that time, I never made it up there. And now with the board gaming stuff, I was like, man, fantastic, fantastic. Loved it. Well, I had to grab something while you were talking there. (laughs) I actually came across this when I was uh, sorting out some games to sell. Uh, cause I, and, and that? well, I was trying to figure out what year I had first gone to Gen Con and, and believe it or not, I, I, I couldn't remember. I even went so far as to call my parents because I was just a, a wee little no lad way. and, um, did they take you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When it, before I could even drive, they took me up to Gen Con and, and then, um, I think in later years in high school, I'd gone up there once or twice with friends or a friend, I think it was. And then I went up there with my, uh, who's now my wife, um, Jen, once, mostly to sell stuff. <laughs> uh, and maybe I might have even taken her twice. But in any case, the first year that I can actually prove I was there was 1991, because I found an autographed copy of Dragon Wing which is in the Death Gate cycle. It's a, a, a novel from uh, Tracy Hickman and Margaret Wise, I think it is. So Tracy, okay. Tracy Hickman still goes to Gen Con. So he's, he's a pretty well known. Uh, it's a he, not a she, but, uh, he's pretty well known. Yeah. And, and he autographed it, you know, to Jeff and best wish. Actually, I got it, both of them to autograph it. So, uh, but oh, it, very it says cool. 1991 Gen Con. So that's the only reason I know. Um, that I was there at least as, as far back as 1991. So dang, that was 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, pointing that out to everyone. So <laughs> you're old. <laughs> yeah. But uh, oh. yeah, it was, um, it was quite different than, uh, versus now. And I, now I haven't made it out all that many years in between, 
Uh, and, and and most of the years I've, I have uh, more or less just peaked my head. Uh, I haven't gone all four days. So this is the first time since then that I've gone all four days or, or since the 90s, we'll say, that I've gone all four days. But yeah, and it was I, worth it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've seen a lot. And, you know, I took I think we purposely took the approach of not over planning and it worked out fine. I mean, there's so much to do. And, you know, my interests, I think our collective interests trended towards, you know, just being able to try a lot of the newer games and see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of what was there to, to demo and, and experience. Oh, yeah. And what was really good, too, was that we tend to have similar tastes with what we wanted to try. So that definitely made things easier. Yeah. And, you know, I, I thought for sure, and we had gone and bought tickets for the board game room just to kind of fill in any time that we had left. And surprisingly, we re- just really had almost no time to spend in that. I think we only even turned in two tickets out of seven. Right. And, and we, yeah, we and, only went twice and, 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 and I got to bring home the rest. Yeah. And, and of those t- two times, uh, only one of the uh, nights were even really there for the, for most of the time. The other, the other night it was just a couple hours, if, if even. Uh, so yeah, we really, really kept busy just with demos and other activities. And I mean, for, for similar reasons, it was a little, little rough trying to catch up with everybody that wanted to catch up with us. I mean, we will have to make a better plan for that. I know some listeners had wanted to uh, meet with us, maybe get a, get a game played with us. And, um, it was just hard to, uh, coordinate all of that. Um, even, even some of the gaming buddies that, uh, that I had from around these parts, uh, really, I think maybe got one game in with, with one group of them. And then there were quite a few others. I just, I didn't even have the opportunity to play, um, with them. So. Yeah. Cause I mean, everybody was just so busy having fun, having a great time, trying all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, one thing, what would you say, for you was the highlight of the con and activity wise spending four days with you, Jeff. <laughs> oh, thank that you. was I'm the flattered. best. <laughs> that was the best. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll we, always think of this as our special time together. <laughs> we, we did make an actual, <laughs> okay. Uh, enough of that sappy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to, I was going to point out though, we did make an actual uh, effort to, uh, to, to stay together and play the same games just so, for um, for show purposes that we could kind of comment on all the same uh, things from both perspectives, right? Which we which we uh, like to point out a lot, you know, the different uh, backgrounds that we have with gaming and such. And um, so we'll see how how well that actually works out with the, with the next show or two. Uh, for for me, you know, yeah, I definitely I definitely enjoyed just being in the you know the dealers hall with all the all the new games and and demos and. And such, but, uh, I think the other thing that was, uh, really exciting for me was just to partake in the annual AEG, uh, special event, uh, their, their, uh, board gamers night, or I forget what it's even called now, but it's kind of limited to about, uh, what was it? Must maybe 350 people there maximum, including AEG staff. Yeah, uh, I think it was 300 tickets, but then they let yeah, a certain was... additional number of people, uh, you know, uh, come by and, and join in the event. Yeah. The, the extras and the floaters, I, you know, I've in the, in the past, I mean, there's, there's certainly been the AEG titles I, I wasn't thrilled with, but you know, I have to say as a company that that's about the coolest event I've seen a company do or, or, or heard of, you know, of course I'd heard of what they had done last year. And I'm not sure if, there were, if there were years before that, there may have been, but last year was really the first year I'd heard of it. And what they do is, well, really, the, I mean, think there's three aspects that impressed me. I mean, the first one is just, uh, you go to this, you know, the hall and, you know, there's 300, 350 people and they just break out, um, you know, 50, 60 of their games. I mean, it's just a crazy number of, you know, they're, they're new copies, just tearing off the shrink wrap of Smash Ups and Thunderstone Advanced and all their different new games, laying them out on the table. So if you didn't have an opportunity to play them in the dealer's hall or if your demo was a little quick and you wanted to sit down and play a full game, there were ample copies, ample uh, players, you know, to play with. Uh, you know, I thought that was really, uh, really cool. Uh, and, yeah, you know, there were about, because I went through that whole area a little bit later on uh, in the evening. And there was about 70 tables that they had and they 
on average, put about two games per table. Right. So that's a, that's a crazy number of games right there. Just, just oh, yeah. shared with, with the fans. And then, you know, as, as if it, as if it stops there. Right. So on top of that, they raffled off what seemed like another hundred games. And so this was no token prize drawing. Right. I mean, it wasn't oh, like, no. Oh, here we've I mean, got five copies of a game, you know, to give away. It was stacks and stacks. And oh, yeah. Cause they had, let's see, there's one at eight o'clock, nine o'clock. 10 and 11. So that's four different raffles where they would give out copies of, you know, Thunderstone, you know, copies of Smash Up and, and the, the whole, all, all whole these... series of Thunderstone. Right. And they, then every game they've ever, you know, seemingly ever made, they gave away at the end. Yeah. That was guy. the last raffle where you basically got one of everything, like all the Nightfalls. You got some L5R, you got the Thunderstones. Ninja, I mean, Scorpion, just, Clint, you know. Was, I, I saw the guy that won it later on in the night. I don't know if you saw him. Somehow he had gotten a little two-wheeler, a little hand truck, and that's how he was, like, moving the games out. I don't know if he yeah, that like, or borrowed it off of them. people walking behind him, but, I, you know. Because it was probably about a four-foot stack of games. I mean, yeah. maybe a couple hundred bucks worth. And, no, didn't they say it was, like, $800 worth? Retail, yeah. So that sounds Retail, about right. Yeah. And then just so no one went away a loser, which of course I, I would have because it seemed like they had one prize drawing per person there, uh, but somehow I didn't win <laughs> anything. Um, wah, 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 wah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm used to it by now, but, uh, that's hey, why, that's I'm why we, the same boat. That's why we give away nothing either because at least we're on one half of it. But yeah, just so no one went away with nothing, then they gave a, a box as you would leave. Although they kind of broke the rules this year, but, uh, you got a box of stuff and, uh, in that box was all kinds of, of goodies, including a, uh, a, a limited edition gold foil, uh, box of Smash Up. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, not only was this, this was a game that sold out at the con, but, uh, not only was it just a copy of the game, but it was a special copy of the game that, uh, apparently, I guess even employees can't get. Um, so it was only for this special event. And, uh, also, uh, the latest copy of Nightfall, uh, the, the self-contained version All of that. One. Yeah. Yeah. And then there were some other, uh, you know, the Avatar promos for Thunderstone. There was like a little ninja promo figure in there, uh, some L5R stuff. Um, so a, a nice little gift box all around, uh, just for, for those who attended. So that's pretty classy on AEG's part. I mean, uh, each of those, uh, really, any of those, even by themselves, it just makes for a great event. But then to do all three as part of one, um, I thought was awesome. And really, and and I got to say that that event was a heck of a lot of fun. I mean, basically, you got to play any of their titles, and their their staff was. I mean, they were all over the place. Yeah, I mean, just yeah, it walking was really, up and down um, the aisles. It was really, I think, one of the highlights for me, if not the highlight uh, for me. And and one of the reasons for that is, uh, you know, something. Over on the far, far end, another aspect that was really ultra cool is they had uh, some prototype copies of the new Tempest series of games. So that's uh, Mercante, uh, Courtier, and uh, Dominaire. So all three of those games you could you could play in what was, uh, in, in most cases, I think, close, very, very close to the final form from what they were saying. Uh, you know, so that was another thing that was, you know, there was, those weren't in the demo hall. There weren't really anywhere else to go and, uh, get a play in of that, but you could, you could play them here at this special event. So. Yeah. And I don't know if it, was that even announced or did no, they say it was kind I, of a, a secret thing at the last minute? I, I think, uh, yeah, we had been talking with, with, uh, one of them and I think they weren't uh, even sure they would have all of that together, but they, you know, they had to kind of rush produce components and such. So. I don't think anyone expected it. I don't think it was really part of the event description yes. or announcement. And, and, Thank uh, you, Kinkos. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people, you know, there were a lot of people that knew about the event from last year and just kind of showed up to get the box. And, uh, of course, you can't win the raffles that way. But, you know, they – Right. That, that I don't know. I, I mean, I guess it is it is what it is. But I, I would feel a little weird doing that. I don't know. I, I, there were There were two stacks of boxes that they had up against the wall. On one side was the 300 boxes for the pre-registered people, and there's about 125 for, you know, extra boxes for people with generic tickets. And we, we sat closer to the generic area, and I remember within a couple of minutes of the event starting, there was about four or five people that immediately got their boxes and walked out. 
So, I mean, they were there just for the goods. I mean, they didn't even pretend to, to yeah, be there yeah, for that. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I guess it, it depends on how you look. It's like the people that sign up for an event and then don't show. And you could argue, well, you know, somebody else probably really, I mean, I'm that person, right? I, I really wanted to sign up for, I don't know, the Twilight Imperium, you know, event. And I couldn't because it was all sold out. So, uh, you know, if, if I found out that, you know, they had <laughs> entire tables that were basically empty because people didn't bother to show up, well, that's that's a little annoying and upsetting to me. So, yeah, you could argue, well, you know, they paid their $2 or whatever. Uh, what What difference does it make, uh, you know? Well, fine, I guess, right? So, so for those you know that got their box and left and didn't participate in the the event, you know, it's their loss. Yeah, I mean, I actually, that's, everybody had a great time. That's the thing, because I thought it was actually one that. of the better better times we had there, and then especially just getting to play. Uh, in our case, it was Dominaire and 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 talking uh, to some of the people around that, and uh, really just that whole night. So, uh, yeah, I think that oh, was the, sure. the highlight event for me. Oh, ditto, ditto. So I guess we should uh, talk about some of the games that we played. Let's do this. All right. So what we decided to do, you know, I mean, it might, uh, for those that have listened to a lot of shows, you know, you kind of maybe used to me being unimpressed by some of the latest games, <laughs> right? It does happen. I've played, uh, it's probably got to be after Gen kind of feels like it must be 1,600 different games now. I uh, used, used to say 1,500, but really, you know, it's rough. And, and Rob, you got to be getting closer to that now where it's like, you know, another game where there's wooden cubes and, you know, you, you push them around or another no, bidding I'm, game. I'm not or, as jaded as you. Not as jaded, <laughs> not as joyless. I, I, I still in, enjoy the games unless they tend to be very long <laughs> and All I right. get bored. And, well, I, I, I You know, something that, happens like my phone battery runs out, then I'm sitting there yeah. staring at the wall. I sense that there's some coming up in maybe the next episode that you might not be as positive <laughs> on. But yeah. in either case, I think what we've got for this show are the are the games that really impressed and impressed in a specific way. So these aren't necessarily the best games that we played or saw or demoed at Gen Con, but they're definitely the ones that were surprisingly good, that we really didn't expect to be as good or as great as they were. Uh, in you many know, cases, you- they... You can almost think of them like the shiny pennies that, uh, you know, we walked away from and basically said, Hey, this was pretty good. And it was a surprise. Yeah. Was, and you know, we went there, you know, with the full intention of playing certain games and, you know, we did. And, and then other ones, you know, we just kind of walked by and, Hey, let's try this. And it's like, wow, this is going to be on my list. Yeah. And so a lot of these, of course, we only got to play one time or, or, or in, in a couple of cases, we got to play more than once, but, uh, so, you know, so, so be that as it may, um, you know, that's a lot of what Gen Con's about, you know, demo a game, you know, get, get your first impressions, you know, share them and get the buzz going or not. So, uh, yeah, so we'll talk this show about all the ones that impressed us, uh, the, most surprisingly. And then, uh, you know, next show we'll talk about some of the ones that, uh, maybe didn't live up quite to the hype or, uh, or just other stuff that we played. Yeah. And if you didn't pick up from the show title, that will be part two of our Gen Con coverage. All right, so last show we introduced a, a, a new segment, a reoccurring segment on the show that we called Feedback Attack, right, which is our sort of permanent name for listener feedback. And, and we have applied for the trademark for that. Yes, we way. have. And You in, know, you, you all you other guys, just so you know. And in, in this show, we'll, we'll kind of do a, an introduction to a new segment, then I'll give you the purpose of the segment. The purpose of the segment is really because, uh, you know, we do have a couple of you out there that, uh, that like to describe me as, as jaded and joyless and overly negative. So, um, so I figure what better way than to have a segment that, uh, that proves you all wrong. So <laughs> am I that bad on you? <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, so, so the point of this new segment is just to highlight a game. That, uh, that we think is particularly awesome. And it may not, may not be a game that's a perfect 10. It may or may not be a game that we've played, uh, a hundred times or, you know, or, 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 or even twice. Uh, but it's a game that we, we truly think, um, is, is awesome. So, uh, therefore we're, we're kind of going with the TBGL gold medal winning board game of the week title. That's a mouthful. Yes. 
Uh, and in, and in this special case of Gen Con, of our, of our top most surprisingly good games, we're really going to apply that to, uh, each of the normal sort of subcategories of games and, and just, uh, one by one go through a category and then tell you what game was most surprisingly good in that category. So with that, Rob, uh, introduce our first TBGL gold medal winning board game of the week. All right. Here we go. So we've been talking a lot about the AG event where we had such a great time on Friday night. That end of the night, we got to play kind of a surprise. At least I wasn't expecting it. I don't know about you, Jeff, but it's a game called Dominaire. It's still in a uh, prototype form. It's going to be out this winter, right? Or Q4? Yeah. What are you going to call it? Maybe. Somewhat soon. Yeah. And, you know, this game was, you know, not, not your average game in some respects because it was a, uh, piece of, uh, I don't know, heavyweight paper that was taped to the, <laughs> taped to <Yeah>. the table. <laughs> and it used, uh, cubes from Risk games and the cards were sleeved in, uh, Thunderstone sleeves. Were they? I didn't even pick up on that. Yeah, they were. They nice. Were. But th- that's all good because in the end, the game was a heck of a lot of fun. Yeah. So this is, this is essentially our winner in the, the middle to heavy weight Euro game. You know, this is, this is one that had I not gone to the AEG event, I, I might not have even sat down and, and, and played it. Oh, you know, walking by, it's, you know, Hey, there's more, more of those good old cubes to push around. You know, there's something about area control, you know, snore on that as if we need another one of those. And, you know, the, the artwork is, is, is nice, but it almost needs to be over the top these days to catch your eye. So uh, maybe almost too subtle or something like that. And even the title yeah. is a little, you know, lackluster, perhaps sounding, you know, just yeah, it's like, well, what is Dominaire? Right. So and a little bit of background on this game. I'm, I'm not going to go into it a whole lot because you can look this up online on BGG and on the AEG site. But this is one of three games that are set in the new Tempest universe where basically AEG has gone through and they've pretty much scripted an entire like world and environment. They have characters and, and all sorts of things just scripted out and people can apply with AEG to get access to this intellectual property where they can then use this to build games. And and who knows what else? I could see people doing books and possibly yeah, even exactly. movies and, and whatnot. And see, that's why, I mean, I think I was sort of skeptical of of the idea. I mean, in, at one lo- level, it sounds like, oh, that's that's not been done before. That's really kind of a neat idea. That's, you know, genius. And on another level, it's like, well, you're still going to be pasting on a theme to a Euro. I mean, what's the difference, right? But yeah, I, you know, after after playing the game, and, and, and looking at it and, you know, taking a step back, I, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited to, to be, you know, to get involved in that storyline or, or see, you know, I think just having even more than the salt and pepper dusting of, of theme that the average Euro has really does make a huge difference. And so, you know, yeah, maybe it doesn't run as deep still as, as your average Amera fun game, but, uh, for, for a Euro, I think it's still, makes for this very different experience that you know when you compare it to say El Grande or some you know with some of these classic area control games or whatnot uh they're, they're, it's just this game's now in a whole different league by comparison oh yeah um, and and for that matter really to even call it an area control game is not accurate because this is this is sort of like if you think of what deck building is to a few acres of snow, right? I mean, uh, area control is really just one mechanic in the game, and and perhaps um, you know that there's more of importance to say about the game than that to really describe it as just an area control game. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they're you know to give their description, you're basically the puppet master of a conspiracy that's that's trying to control the the city. I guess it it would be. Um, you know, the, the map is really well done. The art, I think, is, um, reminds me a bit of a, a really well drawn Dungeons and Dragons map or, or something yeah, to that effect, yeah. right? Just, uh, you know, there's individual buildings in the city that you can make out that correspond to, 
uh, more valuable spaces, you know, so that the artwork has it was some kind sort of, like of value. Districts, yeah. And, uh, and you can kind of, um, gather some of that even from the way that the art was done. So I'm, uh, you know, the board, uh, very pleased with what that looked like. Um, you know, what you'll do is really there's all these agents, uh, which are represented by cards and you're using those to spread your influence in the city and sort of building your network of, of hidden power. So, you know, to, to talk about what the gameplay is like. Okay. Well, I, I guess I should say first that we'll try our best to get all the details right on this, but keep in mind, we, uh, this was a, a prototype version, even if it's close to final, uh, as, as they were indicating. And, uh, I, you know, at, the best I could do was kind of jot down notes very quickly. So hopefully I get nothing wrong. And, and by the way, the, the gentleman that taught the game to us did a fantastic job. I mean, not only of explaining the game, but I mean, that poor guy, he'd been out there all day and, you know, he was teaching it to us at midnight. Yeah, I, was I at don't one know o'clock, why. We, at one o'clock, I think we finished that. that. <laughs> we hit him up at like, uh, yeah, pretty much <laughs> when the event was already over. And I think we were the last people there still. So we, and I, and he w- really wanted to go keep on going, but unfortunately we had to get her car out of the parking garage. Yeah, we picked the, so we had to the call it a garage night. that closed at 2 a.m., so we had to jet uh, before the game was fully done. But we got most of the way through it. Uh, the way that the game functions is you have a game board, and it's got a number of districts on it. Uh, for example, there's several swamps. I believe there's three of them. There's a whole bunch of canals. There's the Senate, the merchants, the church. Uh, there's about a dozen altogether, approximately. And the game was also played with cubes, of course. And also a whole bunch of cards. So each of your cards is an agent uh, that you use to spread a conspiracy or essentially, you know, you use these agents to kind of, you know, take over different, you know, the different districts. So what was really interesting about this is that as the game progressed, what you would do is you would play these agents in a specific order. So, for example... You, you put down your first agent, next turn you put down your second agent and your third, and they have a number of, what would you call those, Jeff? Actions? Yeah. Or, exactly. yeah, let, let's go with actions. So they have a number of different actions on them at the bottom of the card. So one card might say, you know, on action, uh, sorry, on phase one, uh, you know, do this, or on phase three, do this, on phase seven, do this. So, where this card is laid out in this sequence dictates which of these actions you can actually complete. So, for example, on the first card, you can only do action one if it's there. If it's not there, you're kind of out of luck. The second card, you can do actions one and two. The third card, one, two, three, et cetera, all the way down the line. These cards also have three numbers on them. Uh, one is gold, which is the amount of gold that this card receives at the beginning of each turn. Then there's influence on there as well. And there's another number of which I don't remember what it is. <laughs> it's neither influence nor gold, <laughs> whatever it was. And at the beginning of each turn, you get cubes that you place on these cards and they free up as you do Abilities. So, for example, if you get a certain character, it might have, like as was in my case, it'll have a little Senate symbol. So, that's where you put your occupation cubes, let's just say, uh, at the beginning of your turn. And each district, for example, again, the Senate, it had probably, what, about 10 different squares on it for occupation? Yeah. And those squares will have numbers on them. For example, like two, four, one, minus one. Those are points that are received, you know, later on towards the end of the game. And then you also have the ability, once you place your cubes, you can pay money, you can pay gold to move your cubes from the recently placed location to adjacent cubes. So that's how you can kind of spread out. And uh, you basically go on and uh, you know repeat this a number of times, right? Yeah. I, so let me uh, let me run and have lots of fun. Run you guys through the uh, turn sequence. So what you'll have on the board is a uh, turn track over on the right, which is a recent addition according to uh, 
he who explained the game to us, whose name I forget. The The game takes you through seven seasons. It's not called Seasons, so that's an interesting coincidence, but uh, there's a track, there's seven seasons, and what you're going to have is you're going to have three seasons, and then uh, there's a special uh, agent draft, and then you'll go through the remaining four seasons. And now the, the main point to each season is to uh, play an agent card down. So you'll only ever really have seven agent cards played, unless for some reason there's a one that breaks that, which uh, we didn't come across anyway in our game. So the uh, the actual phases then, there's a conspiracy select phase. Uh, that's where you select kind of the card that you're going to play. Then there's an event card that uh, comes up, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Then there's what they call a canvassing phase, where you basically place the cubes and such on the board and take your money. And then you get two actions, uh, action one and action two. So action one will go around, and then action two will go around. Now, to, uh, to talk about the um, specific game components. So first off, the, the map, is, uh, as Rob already mentioned, there's a, a variety of districts, uh, which are basically represented in squares, when you uh, do that canvassing phase and you select one spot, some of the spots will have victory points in them. Uh, one, two, or negative one uh, is the most common. And then I think there's one, three, and one, four. There aren't a whole lot. Yeah, that there's are worth two more. and four in the Senate. I remember those. Yeah. Uh, and there's a couple of canals that are worth a point. Uh, it basically, each of your agents will have a colored card. And then there's, of course, there's the token you know wild set that you where you can place anywhere but the the cards will um, say what district they're in and so uh, the the big choice in the cards is to decide uh, not only is there a certain amount of cubes that they'll get to place and a certain amount of money that they'll get but there's also a uh, exposure rating uh, an exposure is kind of like um, how much uh, how would you describe that rob like um, almost like no, oh, yeah, how, yeah. how noticeable they are because if they're a really well known individual and you're using them to influence a particular region, you're going to get a lot of exposure because there's going to be more talk about what this person is doing versus if they're more, right. uh, uh, more of a deceitful, uh, lesser known person, uh, but still influential perhaps or still wealthy, uh, then maybe you get, uh, tokens, uh, or that is cubes. Uh, and or money, but necessarily not the exposure. And so there's an exposure track in the game, and it's very much a huge part of the game where you're trying to determine, uh, uh, based on that track, who the scapegoat is, you know, so who, who this all really gets pinned on. Uh, it's going to be the fall guy. Yeah, you don't want to be that guy. So that's the person Never. highest up on that exposure track. And uh, the end game scoring is very much centered around that too. So... The uh, the main other thing then, so on, again on these agent cards, you'll have the district that they can play in, the uh, essentially the number of cubes and the number of, of gold that they get, and then their exposure rating. Uh, but then perhaps most importantly, there'll be a variety of abilities or, or actions on that card, uh, and they'll have a number from 1 to 7. Now, the 1 through 7 uh, correlate to two different things. Uh, first of all, what uh, phase you're, or what season you're in, Right. So if, uh, if you have a number four ability, then you cannot use that in seasons one, two, or three. You can't use that until later in the game. Um, so even, uh, you know, even if perhaps that were placed out early. And then also that has to be the, uh, rank that they're placed in. So they have to be the fourth person. So, you know, I guess that's a way of saying. Well, they don't have to be the fourth person. Like I said earlier, you just can't use their ability then. No, so like if the first guy you play has a, a level six ability, he'll never be able to use it even in the sixth season because Correct. he's in the first rank. Absolutely. Oh, so and where were you I'm, challenging my previous statement? I was just saying you could place that one there and get the money and the influence and the... Ah, okay. Okay, you I know, see. You can yes. get all the, the, the stats off it. You just can't use that ability ever. Right, okay. So so to, to clarify that again, so if... um. And, and I have an example here of the, the cards I played. So I played one that uh, the very first agent I played w had a one, two, and a three action. So, and this was in the first season. So even, even though 
it'll eventually get to season two and season three, I can never use the two and the three ability because it was placed as the first rank, the first agent. Um, so I, I go ahead and I can continue to use them for placing cubes uh, and receiving gold and for using that first action, uh, but I can't do any more than that with that agent. And and then in the second spot, I placed uh, an agent that had a level two and a level six. So I can, again, I can sort of immediately leverage that level two ability, but never the level six, even once it gets Correct. to season six. And then more optimally, I played in the three spot uh, an agent that had a one, two, and a three. So since it was already season three, by nature of the fact that I played in the third spot, I could actually immediately use any of those three actions. Uh, you know, the one, the two, or the three, the ones that are equal or less than its, its spot in the agent ranks and uh, the season or less that it was. Um, so that, that works out to be a very neat mechanic. And uh, there's just a lot of options. And normally, you know, I'll, this will make the little segues where I normally ex- explain why I, I hate games. But, I, you know, there's a lot of these games where there's just too much text on cards, right? And everything has all these varying powers and it's maybe there's too much to keep track of. Right. Lots of icon- iconography or whatever the case might be. This one, you know, maybe maybe it's because everything's spelled out in English. Uh, it just seemed very approachable. Now... Back to the uh, the phases of the game. So in the conspiracy phase, that first phase, you're going to pick one of those cards and play it down. Then uh, in the event phase, there's going to be two symbols on the card that you draw, plus perhaps some some special text. Uh, but the two symbols, whoever the current scapegoat is, is going to be able to push one of the uh, victory point tracks up in value and one down by uh, by the value. And uh, what that is, is that's the current value of the person that controls that district. So of the districts on the board, there'll be a certain starting point of victory points that, uh, you know, basically at the end of the game, um, that's what it'll be worth, uh, right? Because you don't score during the game. Correct, Rob? Correct. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so the scapegoat, even though that's a, b- a bad thing, might be a good thing here because you get to choose that. Uh, and then as, as you move past the event phase, uh, you know, of course, there's also be other text that does different things. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the common thing will be these two symbols. The canvassing phase, that's where you take all of, as you've laid out three, four, five, however many of these agents you've laid out, each one of them, you put the cubes on there, you put the gold on there, and then one by one, you'll do this, uh, canvassing where you place them in the corresponding territory, or if it's wild, you place them in the one of your choosing. And it's only one location, but then you can spread out. Uh, and, and I guess this is where that victory point cost comes in too, because now the higher the victory point value, the more it costs to spread out. So you kind of want to get a foothold before it goes up too much in value, or it's going to be more difficult f- for even you to establish a better foothold. So if it's worth five victory points, you're spending five gold to spread out then as part of that placement into another uh, square. So that's kind of a neat thing. And then you go through the action um, phases. So the the different actions are the the card abilities that we've already kind of covered. Uh, there'll be a district majority bonus ability. So once you establish a majority of you know controls controlled squares, and that just means that you have the most, not necessarily the most cubes in the the whole area, if that makes sense, right? So you'll have a bonus ability that you can leverage. Uh, you can also recruit cards, so you'll draw two cards, you'll keep one of them. This gives you more options for placing down agents. Very good, right? Uh, if you're really out of things to do, you can just take a, a gold crown, they call it. Um, you can rally face down cards, so there's certain cards that you can sort of sacrifice and turn them face down for a particularly good use, uh, and that just means they're not going to be able to generate cubes or gold at all in the future until you're able to rally them. Uh, you can also inspire by dropping cubes in territories. So that's another uh, neat way later in the game, typically, to uh, to impact things. And uh, then I had also mentioned earlier on, after you go through three of these seasons, you'll do an agent draft, uh, which is only once per game. And that uh, that you, you draw um, five agents, I believe it is, and you'll be able to, to uh, you kind of pass them around. So you keep one and then pass them, right, sort of Seven Wonders style, uh, and you'll do that uh, three times, and then you'll end up discarding the rest. So um, really, then that just you know continues until the end of the game scoring, where you're going to score 
the points for the squares that you're in in the city. You're going to score the uh, current victory points for if you maintain control of certain regions. And then also what's going to happen is your exposure rating, if you're the scapegoat, you know, which is the person with the highest exposure for every two points of that, you're, you're going to lose, uh, get a negative point. Um, the lowest exposure the, subtracts no negative points, no matter where you are. And then the people in between, it's one for every five. Uh, and so I think that's basically everything. Anything I left out, Rob, that you remember? No, that sounds about right. I don't know if you had mentioned how much fun the game was. <laughs> Well, <laughs> after yeah, all and, of that, well, that, that's you where know, I was leading in early on with the whole, you know, you just hear that it's area control and cubes and, you know, yeah, 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 you know, more of the same, but it really played out just so much more differently than, than, um, I almost can't even stand area control games these days because I know because they just feel all the same and, uh, especially you know, for me playing war games and stuff, I feel like I just want to start fighting and play like a real, area control Ameritrash game or something like that. So Yeah, because I've got to admit that all of the times that I had played games like Risk and Kahuna was another one. I mean, that really burned me out. And when we first went into it and I found out it was an area control game, I I was really kind of on the fence about it. I was like, oh, man, you know, here we go. Well, have you you tried uh, like an El Grande or? No, not yet. Yeah, and so there's a couple of more thematic ones, like say Mission Red Planet or something like that. But right. but still, this um again, it, you know, area control is just one little aspect of the game, and there's so much more going on to it. And yet, oh, it, in a way, it was really pretty easy to pick up. But yet, you see where that depth comes from, and uh, you know, just uh, you know, it's it's really um it's really just kind of a neat game the way it all is put together. I mean, even the event cards. The, the fact that you have the adjustment decision, uh, and of course each event card has two different events, one for the first three seasons and one for after that agent draft. So there'll be a, a difference there. Uh, you know, just all those different abilities and all the different agent cards that, you know, that depending on how you draw them and how you choose to play them, you may never get to use a certain ability this game, but you know, next game you do. And there's just a lot of variety there and. You know, I see where there would be a lot of replayability here and uh, a lot of room for, you know, improving one's skill at the game. And, uh, you know, the artwork is great. Oh, for the, sure. Uh, the fact that it's part of this bigger universe and that there's a story behind it. And and this was uh, the you can third game, in right? Well, in a way, it's the first one because it gets, I think it gets referred to as the third one because there's been almost no details on this game to date where there's been details on the other two. But that's because this is sort of their flagship game. This is the the oh, big yeah. main game, as they described it to me. So yeah, and and there was a little bit of st- story that went into this, where this game comes after the events that happen in. I believe well, the first more one, correct. specifically, the other one's a prequel to this game. Correct. Right? So this game was around first. This was this is sort of the one they baked. And then of the other two games, uh, you know, as it was described to me, and I, I, sh- I should have noted it, but I believe it was Courtier that was originally like a King Henry. The you know he he told us, but it, it was themed. You know, it had a theme, and they sort of rethemed it for for this setting. And then the other one, Mercante, uh, they went out and, and sort of shopped and, and got a designer. Uh, I, I, I believe I've got those details right, but again, forgive me if any of this is slightly it's, it's off close. because yeah. <laughs> we were, I was uh, taking notes as, as best I could while still trying to um, take my turns timely and, um, you know, enjoy the game. So yeah. And, and if, snapped a couple pictures too. So I mean, and, I, and if you I, don't I, have I it correct, somebody up. will challenge you. Oh, I'm sure. So uh, yeah, so this is definitely um one of the one of the most exciting games uh you know I played at Gen Con 2012 and definitely the most impressive, most surprisingly impressive uh mid middleweight to heavier euro that I played uh, by far. Oh yeah, it, it was definitely a nice surprise and it was a game that I, when we finished the game, you know, as as tired as I was cuz we had been there for over 12 hours. Oh, oh we would have been left. there till 4 in the morning. Hours. Absolutely. Yeah. If we didn't have that dumb yeah. parking garage decision, yeah, we only, we only did that because we had had alternate plans for that evening. And that's just how quickly, 
your plans can change because we, uh, we decided to hop into this event and our, and our, our previous plans and, uh, got all messed up. So, uh, but I'm very glad because this ended up so much more fun. Yeah. So thank you to AEG for making this great game. And thanks to the, uh, gentleman from AEG that showed it to us at such a late hour and, you know, kept him from <laughs> retiring like everybody else. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Game. Right. Uh, definitely be picking this one up. Okay, so if uh, if Dominaire was our medium heavy euro of the of Gen Con, then uh, our next category would probably be, well, for lack of a better one, what best reprint, and probably one of the best games at the show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 hard to put a label on this one because it fits <laughs> so many. But that game would be Merchant of Venus, right. So again, just one that I guess, you know, and I, and I'd played the original 20 some odd time. I mean, not too many that I could even count. Uh, you know, this was one of my favorite games as a kid, as a teenager. Um, one of the few Avalon Hill games I really didn't want to part with when I went to, well, I guess I did bring it to college, but when I came back from college and, you know, moved in with my uh, girlfriend and all that, uh, and, and gave up quite a few games, it definitely was one of the ones that hurt the most. So uh, definitely invested in the original, but I, uh, like many, didn't expect much from the reprint, or we'll say I didn't expect much to be changed, and I maybe didn't expect to like what was changed. So the most impressive thing, first off, about Merchant of Venus was just how much was changed. Uh, but before I go into that, you know, Rob, I think this was your first time playing it, so what were, what were oh, your thoughts oh, and yeah. experiences? So what I knew of Merchant of Venus prior was that it had kind of a cult following. I had, of course, seen all of the print and play versions or whatever you want to call them that were available. And people made themselves. I'd seen the files that were out on BGG before they sort of disappeared. And I really didn't know what to make of this game. And when I, you know, sat down and played it and played it, you know, a couple of things went through my mind. Now I'm a big sci-fi buff. So the theme was, you know, a home run for me. And, you know, I love spaceships and, you know, it's got uh, a really fantastic, like graphic look to it. You know, just like the, the print and play versions. Yeah. And I, I don't think the, the long shots, uh, that have been shared to date really do it justice of just how beautiful the, even the chits, just the, the little square, uh, you know, counters in, in this game Very really thick. look. Well, that and, and I mean, just, just the whole look to them really is, um, maybe a little busy, I guess, but that's in tune, I think, with the, the theme and, and such. But, uh, but for my taste anyway, I think they're perfect. I mean, I can't imagine um, there's a lot of information on there that, that uh, you know, is really useful and well laid out. They've sort of changed the way a lot of that's done. Uh, oh, yeah. know, I mean, they they got rid of a couple weird things bef- from before where there used to be like a 7A and 7B, and now it's just 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I mean, it kind of just makes more sense, oh, yeah. really. And so, it, so it's at first you kind of look at some of these things and go, well, why do they have to change that? Why do they have to change that? But then as you think about it, yeah, you know, the, these, these, these changes make sense without really changing the game. I mean, that doesn't change oh, yeah. the game. So, so what if instead of 7A and 7B, it's, it's 7 and 8 if, if you still have the same spread of, uh, of goods and goods destinations and such. So, so there was a lot of so, little subtle changes like that that, uh, uh were, were neat to see. Oh, yeah. And so when we sat down at the game, I mean, the board is huge. I mean, it is a ginormous board. It's got a lot of stuff on it, a lot of planets, a lot of routes going all over the place. And there's a lot of components to it. So initially it was a little overwhelming, but the gentleman that taught the game to us, uh, I don't remember his name. Yeah, his name was Rob Kuba. He doesn't know yeah. much about Merchant of Venus at all. Oh, not at all. He's, he's, <laughs> he's just the guy that redesigned it. So Only. But he did a fantastic job teaching the game. And, you know, I think everybody at the table picked it up really well, even you, Jeff. Yeah. You know, after me. his uh, expert teachings. And well, well, surprisingly, I, I wasn't as ready to play it um, as I would have thought, just because there was a, a bunch new about it that that did require explanation, even for veteran players. And 
you know, and, and, and most of my plays were years ago. I, yeah. And I'm really so, glad that halfway through the game, you didn't flip the board over to see what it looked like underneath, by the way. You know, to, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know that I care. I think the new version is, is better in all ways that I, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be one that's going to go back and play the original game. You know, I think it's easy to, to say that and think that as somebody who owns the original. But to me, I really see this as that first expansion. So let's, let's say they did it different. And instead of reprinting Merchant of Venus, they just came out with an expansion. And like, say like Twilight Imperium, the first expansion, you know, gave you an alternate set of, of, uh, of, uh, action cards and such. Um, you know, in this way, certain things were replaced maybe in the first expansion. I mean, there's a lot that, you know, you could almost look at it that way. Like the, um, the, uh, now instead of landing on what was fo- formerly the token spaces where you would flip over and usually it would, you know, you'd pay a certain amount of money or whatever and you'd find a relic token or, or that not, you know, that's all been replaced by decks of cards, which makes so much more sense in today's world of games and to have uh, that much more variety. I mean, you can encounter pirates, uh, all kinds of different things are in those decks. Uh, you know, that's a really, really neat improvement that that could be thought of as an expansion. So why wouldn't you want that as a as a classic version of Venus player? You know, why wouldn't you want to, you know, embrace that first expansion that's finally come out after all these years? Just like the optional variants that would come out on the internet where you, you know, which were frequently added in. It just makes sense to do that. Um the 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 feel of the game is still the same to me. They they've just changed around and improved some things. I think that that uh you know make for a uh, maybe a different experience, but I'd like to think a better experience. I think it was better for me. Uh, so, right. so a couple examples, the, there's destination cards now. Um, so that's a, a, a neat kind of thing where you have an objective now that you can immediately go, well, I'm not sure if I should go this way or that way, but okay. If I'm able to meet this objective, I'll get a bonus of some sort. And what did you remember what yours was, Rob? Uh, were you talking about the planets where you, yeah, had where you, where you had to get to a certain, you had to get to a certain planet for a bonus. You had, you know, like destination. Mine was the colony world. Yeah. And mine was the giant planet. I believe. Okay. Was the name. So like Something mine, like I had to get to a shield level of at least four, I think it was, and visit the colony world. And then, then it was worth, um, is it a certain amount of experience points or something like that? Uh, but you get a bonus anyway towards winning. Uh, so, you know, that's different. Um, there's no, I mean, I I guess to go to one of the extremes of, uh, obviously it's four players instead of six players and, uh, they cut out player versus player. And my understanding is even in the standard game. So that isn't included. Now I had asked Rob specifically, Rob Kuba about this and he, I was actually very happy with his answer because he said two things that I was impressed by. The first was that they actually went to the forums and read through, what people's opinions of combat and Merchant of Venus were and that the overwhelming consensus seemed to be that even if people liked them, they didn't really play with them for whatever the reason, various reasons were. And therefore they decided to just remove that entirely and replace it instead with a little bit more of a deadlier world, you know, the pirates in, in the card stacks and just other types of things to, uh, you know, involve combat rather than players versus players, which also probably would drag out the game more. Uh, now he also hinted because I, I pressed, uh, being, you know, being the, uh, former war gamer anyway, you know, it's always something that interests me, that conflict aspect. So he did say perhaps the first expansion might re-explore combat and, uh, you know, if, if they uh, can come up with something that they feel works well. So that's, uh, that's interesting, I thought. And obviously, I would imagine the first expansion probably expands it up to six players as well. Um, just on, on pieces and plastic, though, there's tons in this game. So I don't think anyone could be disappointed in the value there. The, the solo game's also been changed a little bit. It's a, there's a series of challenges now. You know, and then there also you can do like the high score competition thing, but, um, it's kind of laid out a certain way. Now, one of the more controversial things, uh, you know, according to 
those others I've talked to, which actually worked well for me, it was one of my main complaints about Merchant of Venus was the way that market demand system worked. So formerly you would just draw kind of a random token out of bags and there's no drawing out of bags anymore. So there's a whole new replace system for how things come in and out of the game. I didn't take a whole lot of notes on that, so I'm not going to be able to clarify that exactly unless you remember, Rob. No, I don't. But yeah, I mean, so passengers don't come out of the bag at random. There's a sort of a schedule for them. Goods, there's a, a mechanic by which certain ones are, uh, you know, sent back into the system. But the market itself fluctuates and there will be a median price, a high price and a low price as indicated by three uh, kind of wide counters that are in each system. And, you know, I, I always felt like there needed to be some shifting in the markets in, in a game like Merchant of Venus. Uh, and, and there would be times when it was better to sell or worse to sell. And that might factor into, you know, how, you know, how you go about things as well as it also provides a little bit of a race factor. Because if you pick up a certain good and somebody else picks up the same good and you're, and you're honing in on that same destination with that bonus, well, now there really is a benefit to getting there first versus second and maybe then that provides that additional value for these drives which um is a i should say one of my most favorite changes to the game so i think when i uh, you know if you go back a couple of shows i actually reviewed merchant of venus the old version and one of the problems i've always had with the game is just all the well, i won't even say problems because i love the game but uh the things that i i have to think about is all the randomness in the game and if you remember you know, you probably encountered this at least once, Rob, when you're rolling the dice and maybe you roll real low. Yep. Well, that kind of sucks when the guy next to you rolls all sixes and, uh, you know, it goes so halfway across the board. Yeah. So what you can do is now when you roll a one, you can put it in this like throttle spot and you can roll an extra die and you add that to the total. So now you can move further. And in addition to that, they have the same old where you can buy a combo drive or, or yellow or red drive, which basically lets you skip certain dots and therefore move faster. Yeah, the yellow and red dots. Yeah, and, uh, you know, and I think it just was a, it's a system where, um, you know, moving has been, uh, perfected a bit. There's also some slots on, uh, on the board for, for choosing your maneuver dice. And I think there was even ability to choose more than one now based on a couple of different things, which which kind of reminds me of another thing. So now there's a unique ability per race, the pilot cards. Uh, so you have a pilot card, and your pilot abilities were different than my pilot abilities and uh, allow me maybe a slightly different focus. The ship cards themselves, and, and before you would have to kind of go one direction or not, you know, heavy on transport or or uh, uh, and slower or faster but you, you could store less now your ship is more evolve uh, it evolves kind of on its own so you can you can upgrade lasers and shields you can add holds to it and as you improve it there's no point where you ever really chuck it back you just kind of continue to improve and add on to your ship which really makes good gameplay sense too uh, because I, I just like the way that that worked through the game and then the way that they added pilots into that uh, and the unique ability that was really neat. Um, but then, you know, there's, you can continue to draw these mission cards with the reward cards. Uh, you know, that, that's nice. There's a fame and infamy system. So certain things you do will gain fame, uh, and others will, you know, uh, you know, gain you infamy. And, uh, and there's some title cards that come out as part of those, uh, card decks and such. So there's really just a lot, a lot of things that are, that are different, but, but convey the same feeling. A lot of things that are new. Um, they've even done things where they took standard components, like those demand markers, and you can use those now optionally in place of or in addition to what they've done with the game. Uh, the game itself lasts 30 rounds instead of you used to play it at $2,000 or you could play it a more if you wanted a longer game. Um, so now it's 30 turns. Uh, and of course, they still have a short variation and whatnot. So there's spaces on the board that check skills like pilot, uh, your pilot skill or your laser shield or laser or shield skill. And so really what you do is um, you want to roll. Is it higher? I believe, Rob, does that sound right? Yes. And then if you it's, it's if you don't, then you take a damage to your shield, I want to say, uh, and then you can continue moving or you could stop. 
and and uh, not suffer it. So something to that effect. So right. they, they've added that mechanic kind of in place of what was a much more generic one before. And uh, it just kind of all around, I really didn't see any any change that I, I was like, why would they do this? I mean, even if you debate the value in the market one, I think it's easy to see why they did that. And and so what I got from it is that, you know, Mr. Rob Kuba definitely put his time into, uh, you know, revising and improving, sort of modernizing this game. And I think it's uh, moved away from possibly too chaotic and random in a couple of ways and just a little bit more interesting, actually. I guess I want to say interesting and yet with uh, variation through those uh, event cards, through the mission cards, through the pilot deck. And, you know, then it included variants and options in the game. And I was just really, really impressed. And um, what was just possibly, you know, I think I rated an eight and a half or thereabouts before. I mean, it's easily a nine now, and, and I'm pretty darn sure it's going to make a perfect 10. You know, this is going to be the sort of definitive pick up and deliver space race market you know game uh, there's really nothing else like it you know they basically ffg's basically taken a title that you know has a warm spot in people's hearts and they've just made it fantastic so i, I this is gonna be a huge hit it's gonna be a huge hit when it comes out and we're just gonna have to wait and see you know how far reaching that actually is you know, I, I think some of the naysayers will be won over by the fact that the classic game is, is on the back, so there's always that. Um, but, you know, if not, well, there's going to be plenty of the old ones on eBay now for, for low money, and you've always got that. And I, I think what you're going to find over time is you're going to hear all the rest of us talking about how great the new version is and all this neat new stuff, and you'll cave in. You will. All of you. All right. Okay, so, all right, shall we move on to the next one there? Absolutely. All right. So the next one is uh, the Lighter Family Euro. And this is a game that has been hitting the review circuit for about the past, I don't know, two, three weeks approximately. It's a game called Seasons. It's a game that has, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that at least I love. It's got dice, it's got cards, and it's got boards. <laughs> yeah, and, and and this one was one again that uh, if Rob wasn't with me, I would. I don't even know if I would have sat down for this one because I I had really I had missed some of the buzz on this one, and I know it was it hit one of the online gaming sites. And which one was it now, Rob? Board Game Arena. Yeah, and so I you know I don't really frequent that uh, site lately. And, uh, you know, I just, for whatever reason, I'd kind of missed the buzz and, and kind of looking at this game from a distance. I mean, it's a tiny little board in the center. I mean, it, you know, if you're not looking right at the cards, which are really nice, um, other than the chunky dice, it really doesn't really look like that much. And so, you know, also look kind of simple. And, um, but, you know, of course, we sat down to play it and I was kind of immediately just shocked at how different the game felt, you know. So again, you know, it's like we're, where uh, Dominaire, you know, is cubes and area control again. And he was like, how could it possibly de be different? And it was this one for, uh, you know, cards and dice and all of that. It just really went together well. I was very, very impressed. And so, yeah. Rob, you want to give a description then about uh, sure. how the and game plays? Actually, I'm not sure if we mentioned the name of it. <laughs> it's uh, Seasons by Asmodee. Seasons. Yeah, Asmodee. Yeah. And, Absolutely. And uh, this game definitely, it was something that we went to. We were kind of unsure of. I like the buzz that I saw about it. You know, I like the descriptions and, you know, it, it intrigued me by what I saw because the art is kind of interesting. It's got a, uh, a bunny rabbit, uh, kind of like a, a magical bunny rabbit on there. And it's extremely colorful. So basically, the I, I think that's actually the other thing that turned me off to the game because I, the whimsical themes and kind of kitty themes in a, in a Euro just don't, don't do it for me. But yeah, it, it kind of gave me like a, it reminded me a little bit of Roger Rabbit for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. Kind of odd, but. Yeah. And, you know, just talking about some of the components, 
the, the game is, uh, the construction on it is fantastic. These dice are awesome. They're about one inch square cubes for dice, which are huge. And they have a really good heft to them. And you roll uh, a number of them all at once. It's They're one, very readable, yeah. unlike, say, couriers. I mean, you're not straining to try to figure out what symbols are on these things or anything like that. Oh, absolutely. So you get to roll this handful of dice, which is actually a handful, you know, if you're playing yeah. with a lot of character with a lot of people, because you roll one more die than there are people. So yeah, so we a, were chucking five of these things around. Oh yeah, and uh, also just real quick, we were talking to the guy from Asmodee. Uh, he was giving us a little bit of information on there, and he actually told us that they really weren't expecting the amount of interest that they were getting in this game. You know, they, they knew it was going to be good, but they didn't think it was just going to be loved so much that this was actually one of the first games to sell out in, uh, at Gen Con. I believe it sold out within like the first hour or two because they didn't really have all that many copies. Yeah. Which, they'd only air flown in like a hundred, you know, not even, I think you yeah. said 60 or something like that. So I was kind of disappointed because I would have loved to pick this game up and bring it home. But, I, you know, I guess I'll have to wait along with everybody else. So, yeah, I mean, so, I guess. So, so basically uh, how this game works is that there is a central circle, which is the main board of the game. And it's got 12 different uh, sections to it along the outside uh, ring of it. Uh, each one basically denotes a month. So they're numbered one through 12 and, and they're divvied up into four seasons, basically three months each. You have, you know, summer, fall, spring and, and winter. Then, uh, in concentric circles in from there, you have the different, I don't know, I don't know what they were called, elements or, or whatnot. Anyway, you have feathers, you have little flames, you have, uh, water droplets and I think they were referred to as crystals. I want to say, well, you got crystals by trading those in. You would crystallize that. Yeah, you're right. That you're right. thing and, and crystals were victory points essentially. Crystallize. That's what I was thinking yes, about. Yes. Yeah, you crystallize those components. Yeah. Yeah. So there were those four different items and depending on which month, I'm going to say month. I don't know if this is accurate in terms of. Uh, what the game calls them. But for a particular month, there will be a certain um, exchange value, let's say. So, you know, water is worth this many crystals, feathers are worth this many, etc. So that's how you go about getting the points. And in order to get to that point, what you wind up doing is you take turns rolling these dice. So you roll a five six-sided dice in a four-person game, which is what we played. And the different sides will have different items on there that you're able to collect. For example, one side might be, you know, a water droplet and a flame or two feathers, or it might show six, which means six victory points or six crystals. And then it also has a little uh, symbol to collect another card and it also has a circle which means that you are able to crystallize isn't that correct that sounds right yeah so what the people basically do it's it's almost like would you say it's like dice drafting kind of where you you know you throw well, the dice down and yeah, you take you, turns you, taking them you pick one die and you pass it around now yeah. i don't know if you mentioned there's a different set of dice per season yes there is yeah i, I and, did not mention uh, that but there is yeah and so when you're in you know when you're in summer it's going to be really hard to get whatever the you know water i think it is or the you know the winter resource right um or spring you know however i forget it you know i guess the way the colors line up with the seasons but but you're going to kind of have to save up and there you only have only so many slots to save things and at the same time certain cards need these resources too and what's interesting about that is you get a certain number of cards and you have to kind of set them out in sets of three i think it was and the idea is that you have to kind of look ahead and think about what will be available then, what you'll be able to save up, what cards will, will make sense to then kind of come around then. And you also have to weigh that with what their value would be to just crystallize the resources. So you do you spend it on cards? Do you turn it into victory points? Uh, you know, how do you go about things when you and when you roll dice? 
do you, uh, which options do you choose then based on those combinations? You know, some abilities will let you, like I had one that let you reroll a die. That was kind of nice. Oh, yeah. And there are some cards that have, you know, quite a bit of, I don't know if it's really player interaction, but it, it really lets, lets you mess with other people. Yeah. Where, yeah. I think they had, they had pre picked ones for the demo that were kind of, um, less so, but, uh, but looking through some of the other ones, and actually the game is meant to be played with a kind of drafting type setup right. where you, um, you really can, it almost really just do build a deck, but you're yeah, not because really, initially it's not really you do, a lot of cards though. That's the difference where, you yeah. know, like a lot of games you're building like, you know, 50, 60 card deck. That's not quite the case here. Yeah. Cause in the game, I believe that you get to draft the cards when you first start, but for the demo, they pre-pick them. So, I mean, it, it's hard to pick cards when you don't well, know what you're doing. It's actually pre-picked on the real rule book as like the intro. Game, True. Right. Cause, cause it was just right out of the rule book, but exactly, which probably makes sense. I mean, your first game, you're not really going to know. What yeah. Cause you know, well, so. usually those are pre-picked to let you figure out specific. Yeah. And, and I think you know, it did a good job at that because then you kind of, you kind of got a feel for the extra depth that was in the game. And, and what, what was particularly just innovative and neat about it was just all the decision points that I saw and the tension points where I, I really want to do, uh, you know, all these different things, but I can't do this. I don't have enough resources to both use my cards and crystallize. And, you know, they're worth a lot of right now, but I also kind of need it for this card. But then I'm also building to this one. And, uh, you know, I had put these out in this order and I kind of need to adhere to that. But but the game's kind of gone a different direction. So how do I adapt to that? And <laughs> there was, you know, just it really was interesting. And then, of course, just the way the that whole dice and season mechanic was uh, really neat. And you, what, there's actually a marker where you move it forward season to seasons. And, and there's quite a few ways to manipulate that. Yeah, to move it back uh, both and in, forth. Both in card play, but even in die choice. Because at one point I had what looked like three of the same dice. They were going to give me, you know, let's say it was two feathers um, and a star, which the stars are uh, dictate how many cards you can lay out. So you have to kind of build that up in order to place more cards. I got that right, right, Rob? Yes. Okay. And then the, um, there's dots, which there's one die left over, which, which Rob had mentioned before. And that is the number of dots on that is how many spaces the turn marker or, you know, the season marker advances. And so if you were trying to manipulate that either uh, faster or slower, your choice, you know, can influence that, particularly if you're one of the last people to choose a dice. Oh yeah. Because if you're, let's say the last, I should say, if you're the last person to choose the die, you might want to take that, you know, that the, you know, if there's a one and a three dot die, you might want to take that one to advance it yeah, even if it's forward. other sub otherwise suboptimal, it might make more sense just in tor- you know for advancing that because of either what you're seeing other people doing is okay. This is going to hurt them because I know they're they're trying to do X, or just because you know I want to accelerate things because I'm you know I'm ahead in points or you know I don't have anything more to do in this season. I really need that one. So uh, you know that was you know that was kind of an interesting bonus on top of everything else. I mean that uh, as as another kind of way to look at it. And I just really, um, I was really just highly impressed by, uh, by what was otherwise just one play, um, of what the potential for this game would be. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely excited to get my hands on this game when it's available. I believe in September. So we'll have to wait about another four weeks to get it. But yeah. And unfortunately wait. or fortunately, depending on how you look at games, this also looks like one that could probably have an expansion with more cards and whatnot. So looking yeah. forward to that too. Well, it, it does seem more so than maybe some of the other ones, like one that would play just fine if, if this was all you ever had. Uh, there seemed to be enough variety, I think, in cards and, you know, with the, with the way the seasons are laid out. I mean, they'd have to get pretty crazy to add more dice, I think. So. Oh, yeah. Not that they won't try. <laughs> yes. I'm sure they, they will. But by then, I mean, if this is the, if this is the big hit that, uh, we'd predict it would be, then, you know, by then people might be ready for it. So, you know, I heard somebody compare it to Seven Wonders and I don't know if I like that comparison, except that we, we did as, as we were sitting down, I think we were replacing what must have been what, maybe an eight or nine year old girl, 10 year old at most. Okay. Um, you know, there were definitely some younger people who had, who had sat down and played this and seemed to be doing fine with it. So while I don't think you're going to grasp everything, 
Uh, and while I think I would argue this is a lot deeper a game than Seven Wonders, but uh, I think it still has that universal appeal factor, and maybe that's what what uh, that person had meant. Um, you know, that this is just the kind of game that anyone could really like. Um, you know, and then, and then as a, as a gamer's game, you can, you can really take it to that next level of seriousness and, and still have lots of enjoyment with it. So, uh, pretty cool. Oh yeah. Pretty cool. Definitely love it. Okay. So the, that was a, that was our light family Euro game. Seasons. Seasons. The next one would most closely fall into the miniatures category. And, uh, while again, maybe, maybe it is or maybe it isn't the best miniatures game, uh, but it was certainly the most surprisingly good game, um, for me and Rob. Yeah. I would reasons. say, you know, it may not be the best, but it was the best one for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe even overall the most surprising game for you. And that was X-Wing, X-Wing by FFG. So again, for those uh, listeners that have been listening quite a few shows, you'll know that, I had uh, talked down a little bit on on Wings of War and some of my issues with that game, and then I'd been kind of real excited to try the new Axis and Allies Angels 20, thinking that might fix some of what I didn't like in that game, maybe maybe streamlining things, adding a hex grid, whatever the case might be. And and it actually turned out I hated... Well, oops, I said hate. Um, mm. I had issues with that game that far exceeded even the, the issues I had with Wings of War, so... I actually came out of that kind of thinking, much like I did with Descent, that, uh, you know, I'd kind of gotten burned on some things in Descent and looked at other, um, you know, uh, dungeon delving games and only come back to Descent thinking, well, this is the best there is. And then, of course, they went and made another edition, which then fixed everything and was this perfect 10 for me. Well, that's actually kind of what happened with X-Wing here, because Wings of War, I, I came back to it thinking better of it than when I left it, because nothing else out there really was better. But yet I still had issues with it, which now looking at X-Wing, nobody, nobody, including myself, I, I had actually taken it off my pre-order list and all of that. I really didn't feel there was going to be any way this game was going to be enough better than Wings of War that I was going to want it and much less gush over it and want to get everything involved in it. And then unfortunately for my pocketbook, um, that's exactly what's happened. So I was very impressed with the experience that was X-Wing. But what did you think, Rob? This game was a definite surprise for me because, you know, we've been hearing about this game for such a long time. And, and I you went, didn't want to go up and play it. I, I was dragging you, know, you to the table. <laughs> kicking and screaming. No. No, it's just, I, I really had no interest in it, but, you know, I was open to trying it. And I was really surprised because I really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. And plus... You know, I got to admit, you know, the fact that, you know, I kind of kicked butt in the game. I'm sure that, you know, influenced <laughs> me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, so, so this he, dude in a, tie, in a TIE fighter was, he was going to school me and he even made comments, it's going to be bad for that guy. Well, one of us got blown up and it wasn't me. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, he, he blew up in a, in a blaze of glory because it, <laughs> I think you utterly annihilated him. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, flew right through the wreckage. It was so uh, it was close range there at the end. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah. So what's um, what's so great? I think in the way that they've redone this is the fact that in Wings of War, all what you had was all these maneuver cards, and so each plane would have this different stack of maneuver cards, and that just was kind of I don't know if fiddly is the right word, but it was cumbersome. You know, you'd, you'd be shuffling through all these cards going, okay, what maneuver do I want? You'd have to lay it down on the table and cards as they do would spin and you, you know, you'd try to keep it pressed down with your fingers and, you know, you bump the model and somebody would challenge you that you can't really do that. And so you'd move it forward and, uh, you know, it was just kind of clunky really. And, in any case, in X-Wing, what they've done is that in good old FFG fashion, they've taken the dial and they've put all of these maneuvers on a dial. So you have one of these little dials per ship and you just kind of rotate this. And, you know, if you want to do a hard right bank or you want to do, uh, uh, you know, a 180 or whatever the thing is, you just dial up that maneuver, place the, the, the dial face down next to that ship and then, you know, do the same for your other ships. And that's, that's genius, really, because I'm not mixing up cards and getting them all over the place and, you know, trying to order it in some way that makes sense to me. It's just so much more 
fast um, and, and uh, but yet not really simpler uh, and it works and then then what happens is there's all these little templates and uh, the ship has little grooves in it which is again genius where that little uh, arced uh, template just kind of sits in that little groove um, which allows you to then completely remove the miniature from the board uh, lift it up place it down on the other end where it again slides right into that little groove of the of the template marking its uh, final resting spot and uh, and you're done and, uh, and then you have for firing arcs you have nice little lines drawn on the bases where you go ahead and take your straight edge and line it right up there and it's either in the arc or not in the arc you have your range ruler with with range one two and three to to determine uh, if i'm remembering this right let's see in the twos there's no change to dice rolls in the long range uh, they roll one extra defense dice and in the short range you roll one extra attack dice it's I believe I got it right. Um, so again, very just simple system like that for how that works. And then on top of that, you have uh, these enhancement cards, which of course, at least in the Wings and War that I had played, I've never really had anything like that where you can improve upon the ship with, you know, maybe it's uh, an R2 unit that um, is, I think, one of the few ways to repair shields or, you know, um, I, I think your ship had another one too, Rob. I don't know if you remember what it was, but no, I don't. Yeah. So, and then of course your pilot has certain skills and, uh, so there's a lock on, right? So there's a, and I think you did that with the TIE fighter, right? You lock yes. onto it and that gives you the ability to reroll some dice. If you, if you choose that as part of your actions, uh, the TIE fighter has like a barrel roll, which is special, which is very easily implemented and kind of just shifts to the side. Um, and, and there's just the way in which special abilities and different things are, are, integrated into the game and implemented is just very very smart well done it doesn't feel cumbersome or fiddly or overwhelming but yet there's a lot of variety in uh, in just what you get in the base set uh, you know there's tokens and markers for everything that just makes sense just overall I, i'm thrilled and and that was uh that was my thoughts before he mentioned and they kind of unveiled that day that we were playing it um and uh, apparently not that long before we were doing our demo the wave 2 ships and uh you know okay so the wave 1 ships consist of and in a way there's actually six of them right because you've got the x-wing and the tie fighter that's in the base box right and they have associated cards and then there's an x-wing and tie fighter expansion pack which is the same model but different cards right. different pilots different abilities and then there's the y-wing and the tie fighter advanced right. uh, models so that's wave one then wave wave two you have the a-wing great right. you have the tie interceptor right which is a really cool looking one i've always liked that oh yeah uh, but more importantly, you have Slave One, right? Which is Boba Fett's cool ship. And, uh, the big one. The remember big, what that one was? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And a spectacular looking model. Actually, really all of them were for Wave yeah, Two. It was Slave the One. Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Millennium Falcon. Uh, this thing is huge. Real beefy model. Yeah. Just spectacular detail to this thing. I mean, I can't wait to see that sitting in the middle of the board with a bunch of, TIE fighters going at it and, you know, the idea of even doing a monster scenario, right? And have some X-wing supports and a Y-wing in there with the ion cannon. And I mean, for anybody that's a Star Wars fan, it's, 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 it's awesome. And, and I mean, even for those like Rob here who aren't, you know, that are Star Trek fans, uh, <laughs> it's pretty darn cool, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. This, this whole thing, it was such a pleasant surprise. Now, my only regret now is I didn't buy it. <laughs> oh, and I was gonna, but they were already sold out of all the extras. And I'm like, well, if I can't have it all, I don't want any of it. So yeah, be pouty. Uh, I don't want it. Actually, well, they should have bought sold it and out rubbed of, it in your face. <laughs> yeah. They'd even sold out of the extra X wings and oh, TIE yeah. fighters at that, at, uh, at that point. So they just, they just had a few of the base game left. And then I think when we checked back, was it Saturday evening or Sunday morning? They were sold out yeah. even of those. Sunday so. morning, I think when we first got there or when we first walked by, there was maybe 20 of the core set and those were gone instantly. And this, you know, say unlike Netrunner, they had tons of these things and the, the whole 
wall of the expansion uh, models and all of that was gone by the end of yeah, the Yeah, and people like every you, last one. The FFG line to purchase things was huge. I mean, there's easily yeah, like 30 40 people more than one time. Oh yeah. And if you looked, I'd say like two, you know, one out of every probably three people had probably two core sets in hand. Yeah, and the only thing there and I'll I'll kind of remind listeners on this point cuz I I know it gets said, but I, I think people forget you you can't buy a second core set if if you're thinking that that's in place of the extra X-wing and Tie Fighter expansions, um, you know, because maybe you're thinking, okay, I'll get the extra dice, I'll get the, the I'll get the models. It's actually cheaper to do that. But what you're not getting is the the custom cards that are in those two expansions. Right. So call FFG mean or call them smart. I I I personally think. I, I see it as like a bonus. I don't think it was really intentional. You know, this just adds more variety. There, there's only going to be so many cards and models they can put in the game and keep the price point as low as it is, which I think was awesome because they really could have made this like a big box set. Uh, but, you know, to keep it where everybody can can get it and, and, and play a, a basic game, I, I think is nice that it's this more affordable, smaller box. Yeah, so what they've done is instead of making a big box that's expensive – it's a lot of little boxes <laughs> that when you add well, them up, but, they're expensive. But, but then you can you can pick and choose what you want. True, so, very true. You know, and especially if you're playing, you know, at a game store or something, maybe you put your money into the Rebels, and you know, your one of your buddies, you know, buys into the other yeah. side. You know, you don't have to to buy the box and and both have everything. And I was looking online on on BGG in the forums for this game. And there's a lot of people out there that are, their plan is actually to buy two core sets and then one of every expansion. Then that way they're going to have yeah. everything. It's going to be I, five of, you know, five units. And a s- I guess I'd, I'd have to know more about the way the point system adds up. Yeah. Uh, but I could see, I could see that making a certain amount of sense. Uh, yeah. Would- particularly, well, it was something about yeah. having five ships. Yeah, having five I, ships, and then plus you have two sets of the movement. I, I mean, I'd go crazy items. and have like two Y wings or something like that. So, um, yeah, it might just be a value thing. You know, the values in the base set. If you're gonna splurge for the dice pack, and there is gonna be a dice pack for uh, ten dollars, I think it is retail. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so maybe maybe at that point, if you're gonna buy the dice, you might maybe you should just pick up a second. And, starter set. And I can definitely see people, like, especially when the Millennium Falcon comes out, I can definitely see people that when they're done playing the game, they're going to put the pieces up on the shelf to be like decoration. That's how awesome these things look. Oh, absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's Sex Wing. Fantastic game. Okay, moving on. Uh, next one is going to be a little card game. This one is a game that kind of snuck in a little bit. It's, well, there's so many card games at, at a convention like this, just everywhere, these tiny little card games. You know, give me five bucks for this one or ten bucks for that one and, you know, try this, try that. And it's at some point it's like, ah, how many more of these little card games do we need? You know, are they, can there even be any, any decent ones still? Oh, yeah. And that's, then they're that's definitely the joyless, is. uh, jaded Jeff, uh, rant on all these silly little card <laughs> I'm, games. I'm going to call you JJ from now on. Jaded Jeff. JJ. <laughs> hey, JJ. Anyway, uh, this game is the crazy creatures of Dr. Gloom. Is, is that right? That doesn't sound right. Yeah, is that's it, right. Is it crazy creatures? Yeah, this was the one. It wasn't it named like Crazy Creatures of Doctor Doom, but then they couldn't use that in the states. Yeah, so they had to give right. it this goofy name. I, I, for some reason, the crazy part didn't sound right. The rest of it did. Anyway, th- this game is Crazy Creatures of Doctor Gloom. It's a Stronghold Games release. I believe it was. Was this a reprint from White Goblin? Like the rest of yeah, them? That yeah, that sounds right because there was a White I Goblin card so. in there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Michael shocked uh, again. Yes, and surprisingly, I guess. And I mean, I'm for me anyway. I'm, I, I've liked some of his stuff. Obviously, we've gushed over the Zuloretto Warful Spiel, but quite a few of his other titles that have just been okay for me. Oh yeah, and you know, also the maker of the recent Africana, and yeah, which we haven't talked about yet. So we'll do that one yes. next show, <laughs> maybe. 
Well, that or the one after yeah, for sure. Definitely within the next two. So, but in any case, this one, yeah, uh, you, uh, I think you had bought this mostly blind along with, uh, uh another stronghold I, release. I was actually going to pre-order this because, uh, there was uh, a small window where stronghold was allowing the pre-order of this and a couple other titles like milestones and what was it? Time, ugh, little devils, little devils was the name. Yeah. Where you could get them at a discount and also a couple of uh, revolver expansions that they were releasing. So I was planning on pre-ordering it and I never pulled a trigger on it. And then when I saw it at the show, I'm like, here's my money, buddy. Give me the game. Uh, basically what this game is, is you have, uh, four machines that are in different colors and they're two sided cards. One side has pluses on them. The other side has minuses on them. And when it's pluses, you have to play uh, a particular number card. You have uh, different colored cards. There's four sets of them. And again, in the four different colors, they're numbered one through six. Is, is that correct? Yeah, one through six. And uh, additionally, the only other... So each... Um, well, I, mo- I wrote most recently tried this with my wife just to get her buy-in on it. And uh, in, in, say, a two-player game, you're actually going to be dealt out 12 cards each. And then you take eight additional cards and you place it in a uh, reserve pile. Like a draw pile, essentially. Yeah. And then all the other cards get pitched from the game, which will be quite a few, especially in a two-player game. Oh, yeah. So, you know, when somebody plays, let's say, a number four, uh, you have to play, and it's a plus machine, you have to play four or higher. If you play a four, you switch the machine to negative. And the- or... Or you make your opponent take a card from the reserve stack. Correct. Yes. And assuming there's any left. So there, that yeah. can only be done the first eight times, and then you have to flip the card past that. Yes. And that kind of just keeps the game from going too long. Um, or uh, in, in in some cases, you won't be able to, your opponent won't be able to play a card, so forcing you to flip that plays into some of the strategies in the game uh, where you're trying to... Maybe, maybe you've played all your cards for that machine, so you don't really want to do your opponent any favors, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. And then you also have the one and six, which you can basically play on top of each other to, you know, to flip the number. Yeah. So this is a, this is a a good time to point out that this is one of those games where you want to basically finish with zero points, uh, even negative points if you can. And so what happens is the threes and fours are worth two points each if they're still in your hand at the end of the game. When the, when the game ends. So like when your opponent runs out of all his cards. Or really, you can almost think of it like it's not really points, it's damage. Yeah, yeah, that's true. For, we'll stick with the theme. Yeah, or wasn't it skulls? skulls yeah, damage. It's skulls. It's skulls, but yeah, like skull damage. Right. Um, so yeah, three, uh, threes and fours are twos. Uh, twos and fives are ones. And then the ones and sixes are freeze. So if you had a whole hand of ones and sixes, you're fine. You don't take any, any points. Uh, however, if, if you're, uh, completely free of cards, then you score negative three. So you'll actually reduce and, uh, you pay, play the number of rounds equal to the number of players. So with two players, that's two rounds or with three players, it's, it's three rounds and so on. Uh, so then, uh, you know, that's, that's how that adds up. Now, ones and sixes can be played at any time, regardless of whether it's a plus or a minus and regardless of the value of the card. So they, uh, they have a, a term for it. I forget what it is. It's like a mutation or something like that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so that's interesting too, in terms of, well, you know, there's a five out there, but you can, and it's a plus card, uh, but you can kind of reset that by playing your one. And then so it's, you know, you got to kind of really hold on to those powerful cards and decide, okay, when is it worth resetting and trying to play out some of the other cards? Um, you know, can I, do I want to make a match? Do I want to make them take another card and, and try to, change that timing or do I want to flip it to a negative so that I can get some cards played? Um, you know, do I, do I lead with all my two point cards just to cleanse them from my hand right away? Or do I worry more about playing in numbered sequenced sets to try to, you know, go from, you know, one machine to the next? I mean, there's just a, was a variety of, of strategies and ways that you could kind of approach things. And, uh, I also thought, that it kind of in you know in some ways had that feeling of other card games that are out there but yet with this sort of different fresh feeling approach to it 
um, that for as many of these little games as I've played and just kind of rolled my eyes at and like, okay, another one where you're playing numbers and such. I did this one really just felt, uh, innovative enough and, uh, really quick to play that. I mean, that's the other thing, just really, really, really quick game to play. Um, I like that little reserve stack of eight cards. Yep. I like the plus and minus choice. I like the, the skull variation and the free ones and sixes and, and just the whole way it kind of comes together and, and, and goes through quickly. And even like we, like one night we did play the two player and, you know, running through two games and tallying up the score. I mean, just no time whatsoever, but, um, but yet, you know, usually in a game that that's quick, you go, ah, it doesn't really matter that it's pointless and randomly light. Um, it still felt in this one, like even if there's randomness to it, like the decisions you're making seem like they matter and seems like there's a good number of options before you. And, um, you know, even after playing this a couple more times, I, I haven't really lost interest in exploring this one more. And so I, I like it as that kind of really simple, small, right? It's just this tiny little tin can type game. Uh, it's just really surprisingly good. Oh, yeah. Uh, I agree. This is one that I'm definitely going to be throwing in my backpack and I'll be taking it into work and I'll torture some of my Yeah, and, and I should with. say, I mean, even even though you had the copy, I, I had to go on the on the Gen Con floor and <laughs> walk up and buy it by my own yeah. uh, from the Stronghold booth. So didn't didn't want to wait to to put my hands on one and and bring it home and and try it with my wife and you know, cart it around as like I said I've been looking for some fillers and I've been I actually slowly uh probably made six or seven good ones now or even eight, so I I'm kind of back up to my quota. But this is definitely one of them, so um, oh, yeah. I'm very pleased. It, it, it's a fairly inexpensive game. I think it lists for fifteen dollars US. Yeah, that's what we paid at the conference. And so it's it's, it's be, definitely worth be like it. Like under ten online. Oh, so. I'm sure. Yeah, and it comes in a nice little tin. Stronghold's been on a tin kick lately because a yeah, lot I, of their I'm, games are in tins, but this one actually works. I I'm, right. I, I'm I'm on the fence about whether I like tins. For larger games, I'm not a fan. You know, the, I don't like it. The Forbidden Island size, yeah, I don't think I am either. But for the small games that would normally be in that little uh, tuck box, that you know, over time the the tabs tear and they they kind of get beat up, uh, or, or even like the Z-Man box, where again, yeah, that's they, what know, I would kind of get pushed in. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of like this the tin. I just it's it seems like that's just going to hold up better and it's it's easy to like you said kind of toss it in a backpack and not really worry about it or in the bottom of a of a game bag and that kind of thing so i i think it works for for the size game oh, yeah. and, uh, it was definitely yeah. a pleasant surprise and you know it's it's not the deepest game in the world but for what it is it's it's a fun game yeah and the art's kind of neat too yeah I mean, it's kind of Kind of different. I like it's it. Well done. So, well done. Good strong. Good job and, again, Michael. Michael Shock. Yes. You're, you're starting to sell me on your on your games. <laughs> definitely more. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then uh, our next category: tablet games. So we have a variety of these. We'll probably talk real briefly about in the next show. But the one that was the most surprisingly good, that uh, at least I didn't really think was going to stand out or be anything that different or interesting to make me want to just run out and buy it day one. I think we both had the same reaction, possibly. Or did I like this one more than you? Well, I'm a little grumpy on this title, <laughs> just slightly. But that well, has nothing to do with the gameplay. <laughs> okay, so and what was the game? I'll go into that a little bit later. So the, the game is Soul Forge by uh, that uh, fantastic company, Gary Games, the makers of Ascension. Yeah. And and it is Playdeck that's doing the uh, iOS game, right? I believe so, yes. Yeah, I believe so. So here's all there is for me to say about it, and then I'll let Rob say whatever, because I only have one thing <laughs> nice, really thanks. to say. I only have one thing to say about it. Yeah. The only thing that I have to say about it is, if you're going to make a game that doesn't exist in physical form, and to the best of my knowledge, this is never going to exist in physical form, then you better do something that can't be done in physical form or can't be done oh, sure. easily in physical form. And they've done that. And that is what is so surprisingly cool about this game because basically forgetting every other aspect of the game or gameplay, what happens is when you play a creature, when you play a monster, it levels up. So you play it and then it goes into your discard. But as it hits your discard pile, a level one becomes a level two. A level two becomes a level three. And that 
would be annoying as, as, as anything, right? If you had to fish every time you play a card, you basically have to fish out a new one to replace it, right? That would never really work in the physical world. Oh, yeah. I and mean, we talk about all the setup as it, as it is with some of these games and, and the shuffling and stuff. And now we got to fish out and change out cards every time we play one. You know, and it's probably been done in some game that I haven't played, but in, in one that's built around this sort of deck builder concept, you know, like an Ascension or like a Dominion, like a Thunderstone, uh, that's really cool. And that, that certainly hasn't been done. And everything about the, uh, the, the graphics and stuff was really cool. So that's all I have to say. Yeah. It was, it was a very well done game for, for what we saw at least when we did our quick little demo at uh, the Gary Games booth there, you know, and for something that's not complete, I mean, that that says a lot. Now, my only gripe with this game so far is that, I mean, I'm a tab- I'm an Android person, so I've got Android tablets. we got three of them, and we've had Android if you phones back forever. It, they'll make an Android yeah, version. Yeah, so what they're doing is they're coming out with iOS and PC, and they say, you know, if it gets backed and whatnot, you know, they'll think about doing an android one well well we'll see so i don't think playdex done anything android yet so i'm yeah i don't know how hopeful i am on that but you know at least there's pc so i have some hope on that uh maybe i can play it on a train or or whatnot while i'm on my way to work sure okay so very cool game by a cool company So then moving on to Ameritrash, Marathon. All right. Uh, so again, not, not necessarily the best game at Gen Con, but the most surprisingly good one in the Ameritrash category. And that is Z-Man's Battle Beyond Space. You almost got to say that in like Battle Beyond Space, like some announcer well vo- announcerish voice. But then I guess I took that over for me, for you. I like it. All right. Uh, yeah. So. So Battle Beyond Space is a game that I, I didn't expect much from. I mean, I, you know, we, I reviewed, uh, or commented, discussed several other science fiction games that have come out recently, Kickstarter or otherwise. And really with the long list of good ones that there already are, uh, you know, I said, well, do, why do we even really need any new ones at this point? Cause there's perfect ones that already exist at all the different weights of games. Well, then along comes this game and by look, it looks really stupid and generic, right? I mean, here's a bunch of plastic ships on a board. There's not much else to it. How is this ever going to be interesting or better than the slew of games that I already have with little plastic ships and such? Well, it is. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think you liked it too, right? I mean, you were surprised by this uh, one as well. I was really surprised. Yeah. I didn't really know much about it. And, you know, when I, I remember walking by it a couple of times over at the Z-Man booth and I just kind of, eh, okay, moving yeah. on. And, and what's amazing to me about the game is, of course, all my preconceived concept being, you know, being completely wrong, but I, I just, every single one of these games sets out to be TI light, right? And I think they all start yep. looking at Twilight Imperium and go, how can I make a faster version, a better, you know, a better, faster version of it? And then I'll add a little twist just so people can think it's different and I'll get away with something. And then ultimately, you know, there's still ones that are good that I like, but the other ones I just go, really? I mean, come on, can we, can we just give up on that by now and, and try to make something unique? Uh, and then, you know, similarly, maybe they start with one of the PC versions, right? Whether you're, you know, enter favorite PC version of 4X title here, uh, and, and it evolves the same way. Well, this one, Battle Beyond Space, was anything but that. I mean, I think this was really a game that seemed like it probably started as its own idea. And what it, how it works essentially is you have three squadrons of, and I'll never get the number right. Of course, I owned the, I was able to procure a copy of it. It was somewhat limited the first day and they released a few uh, copies each day. But let's say it's uh, in the vicinity of eight ships, I want to say, right? Sound about right? Yeah, squadron. eight to ten, something like that. Yeah, and and then you have two capital ships. And so those are your starting forces. And you'll lay that out in 
uh, one of, uh, if it's uh, three or four players, and it also plays two, uh, though not officially by the box, but you lay that out in one of the starting regions, point it in whichever directions you so choose, and there's some asteroids on the, on the map and such. And then basically the game goes for a certain number of turns. I believe it's eight. That's again, sounds right. Um, and so what you're going to do is you're going to draw a card, and the card is going to dictate how far your units move, uh, how far they can fire, how far they can turn, and then do uh, similarly for a, ca a capital ship. So you're going to look at that, and you get to look ahead one turn always at the, at the end of the turn. And of the three squadrons, you're going to choose the one that can best use those numbers. So if it's four, you know, in which is relatively far, you might choose a different one than if it's one or two. And now if, uh, and you're basically going to move exactly that amount for each ship. So, uh, you know, if you've done things wrong, uh, one ship's going to fly into an asteroid and blow up and another one may collide with an enemy ship and, and blow both of them up. But I, ideally, you've maneuvered and uh, planned this in such a way that your options are all there for the three fleets and you move the one that then uh, puts them in a situation where then based on the range that's on the card, you uh, it's completely diceless combat, so you don't roll anything. It's, it's you know, we'll say all strategy at that level, right? You simply eliminate an enemy fighter if it's within that range of your fighter. The capital ships have a range of two, so they can pick anything in any direction. Fighters only shoot exactly straight. That's capital ships any direction, up to two. Uh, and then you you take those, and those become basically your victory points. Uh, and then at the end of that, you can turn. So then you can turn maybe one hex side and you can turn, uh, that's optional. So some ships can turn, some ships don't have to. Uh, you then pick a different capital ship that can move in that case. It doesn't move exactly that range, but it moves up to that number and then fires up to that number. And, uh, you know, that's basically a turn. And so then you'll see what your future card is. Okay, so you'll get one special power card in addition to that, and examples of those would be, I had one where I flew in a fighter, and I could just blow it up, and I took out a, actually a wounded capital ship and like three fighters that were in range. Uh, what was yours, Rob? Do I, you remember? I don't remember. I think you had a special forward firing weapon that took oh, out like a three by three grid. it was called a mega something. Basically, right yeah. in front of the ship, it blew up a three by three, basically nine spaces. I think I took and out then, like four of your ships with that thing. Yeah, and then and then the the in our three player game, the third player had one that like teleported his fighters uh, forward on the opposite side of a capital ship and let them fire on that. Uh, and so you'll you'll only be able to do that once per game. So you'll have to try to pick a time when that makes the most sense. And then in addition, the only other thing really is then in the center of the board are these. Uh, what, I don't know if they call them relics or artifacts, but they're basically victory point spots where if you're the first one on it, you'll rec reclaim a token that's worth an extra victory point. And then at the end of the game, it's worth certain points to sort of sit on it. So this is a way to kind of uh, leverage maybe if you have less ships, uh, you know, and you've, you've killed less, but you can maneuver over to, to be on these spots and, and your enemies otherwise don't, uh, you know, dethrone you from them. A little bit of a king of a hill mechanic on that it gives you something else to fight over, but besides simply blowing up ships. So, you know, it's basically a game of maneuvering. And, uh, you know, the, there's certainly randomness in the way that your spread of cards come up, but knowing what those cards are, because there's only really, you know, the, the small set of them, you, um, you manipulate and maneuver your different squadrons into positions, and they could be all over the board later in the game. So you might have, you know, half of the squadrons over here and another half's over there, and they each, you know, go forward four and fire up to five and, and turn one, or, in, you know, just as often it's two and, and such. So it's just really a very different game. You know, it reminded me almost a little bit more of like a duel in the dark or duel of the giants sort of setup, but... Uh, you know, dip, really different mechanics even than that, but kind of that same sort of, um, you know, approach to a game. Uh, you know, no, no randomness again, diceless combat, and uh, just pretty streamlined, fast, fast game again. So, I mean, it really played quick. I think that's the other thing to recognize here is we're talking about a game that even with three players, we played in, what was it, maybe 40 minutes, including rules explanation yeah, I and I believe questions that, and yeah, such. Yeah, that was right. Yeah, so that's that's the true beauty in the game is that there's 
Um, you know, it's unique. It really kind of stands out from other games. Um, you know, it's, it's not replacing TI3. It's not even replacing a light TI3, but it's this different game with these cool plastic ships, these nice cards, this sort of whole different mechanic without dice and such. And, you know, what can you, what can you control? What can you do with the part that you can't control? And, um, and it was just fun, you know, played out as like this kind of fun little story of, uh, intergalactic conflict. So I, I, I just really had a blast with it. And, um, you know, looking forward to, to actually seeing a, a game with little plastic spaceships played a bunch. And, you know, it's a type of, type of thing I think, you know, I even be able to get my wife to play and it almost could use as a filler on game night and just a lot of different possibilities for this. So, um, for those reasons, I say, you know, surprisingly good. Uh, definitely for uh, sort of an Ameritrash game. It almost even, isn't even Ameritrash because there's no dice, but, you know, you got the plastic ships, so I'm going to call this one the uh, the surprising Ameritrash game. Oh, yeah. And like I said, this was a game that initially, when I first saw it, I really had no interest in it. I guess I was judging it based on the looks. It's, it's got that retro uh, 70s kind of artwork yeah, cover. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I guess that was part of it, but it's just large blackboard with a lot of hexes on it and yeah these really low profile ships that uh, it, they're a little hard to pick up i guess if i had one gripe with the game um yeah I, they, towards they, the end i kind of figured out if you press down on the nose of the ship with your yeah it kind of finger then you can back, yeah like teeter totter yeah you can kind of uh, but pick yeah it they're the really back. flat models they've got good detail but the bottoms are really flat so they can be kind of hard it, to pick it up. almost looks like they had models of a ship and then they hacked it in half they sliced it <laughs> and then what we yeah. have is the bottom part of it <laughs> it looks yeah. like the bottom of ships or the or the top yeah yeah i know what you're talking about one model in particular really looks like the bottom yeah. half of a, of a model but you know after it, what was really interesting was that i wasn't expecting much but after probably the first turn i was like i really like this after a second turn i'm like yep i like this and then when i won i'm like yeah i like this <laughs> Yeah, I think I mean, maybe it was the first turn or halfway into it. I was like, really? This is all there is to it? I'm like, cause we were, we were fortunate enough. I, we had, uh, we hadn't gotten a demo of this one. I had actually, right. I was able to pick up a copy and we had brought it over to the board game room one of the nights. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't like to, there's a little flag you can put up when you want more players, but I don't like to do that before I've learned the game. So, you know, they have to kind of sit there while I read a rule book. So I, I had just, you know, kind of started to read it and uh, somebody walked up who uh, apparently had been demoing it all day long and said, oh, hey, you know, I'd love to join you if you have room. And so we're like, sure. And, you know, he proceeded to teach us the game and, and very well at that. And, uh, you know, apparently he was uh, knew the designer and otherwise a big enough fan of the game yeah. that uh, didn't mind teaching it yet again. But, yeah, neat Neat, neat game. Uh, was was impressed. Uh, way better than I would have expected. Oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely give it a thumbs up. And that was Battle Beyond Space. Nice. <laughs> Look from the Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, the next thing to talk about is kind of like the deck builder category. And, uh, so, and, or, or, or collectible card game category combined. I, yeah. All in one. I don't know. So, uh, for this over here, uh, we've got Ascension Immortal Heroes. This is a game that I kind of had forgotten about. I know we had talked about it a couple months back when the information on it first came out, but I had really forgotten about it. And I really didn't go to Gen Con expecting to see anything. And when I saw it there, I'm like, yeah. I think I whipped out my credit card immediately. When <laughs> yes, you did. Although I, I veto your choice on this one. so That's okay. So uh, basically, Immortal Heroes is an expansion to Storm, Storm of Souls, which is the third release uh, in the Ascension line, because originally there was Ascension, Chronicle of the God Slayer, and then Return of the Fallen, then Storm of Souls, and now Immortal Heroes. This adds 164 cards. This includes uh, a number of new event cards, center deck cards. And th the newest thing in this game is 40 new cards that they call soul gems, which are essentially like instant actions. So as part of the play, of the normal play, 
it might the card might tell you you know uh you know claim a soul gem so you just grab the next card off the top of the soul gem stack and it'll it might tell you you know get x amount of points or get this get that and then it's a instant it's a one time use you don't get to save it it's not a trophy uh which was something that they introduced in storm of souls where you get to right. keep and, something right and and it, it, that's the crux of my concern because did Ascension really need another stack of cards? Sure. You know, on top of you had, you know, you had the one that was added in the last one and now you have another the more one. The more the merrier. And, and this one's definitely more random, right? Cause you kind of pick whatever you get. And, uh, I actually really, I did enjoy our play very much so. And I'm sure anybody who's a monster, monster Ascension fan, as I am. And me. Uh, would, would really like it. But I don't know. For me, I don't know if I, it was, I I didn't come away from it going like wow I'll never play this game without soul gems again that that's I I guess that's what it would have needed for me to to be that hyped up on it I I just feel like oh okay this is a nice different variation that uh, that I can play every now and again to to change it up even more for for when I'm bored with the base mm-hmm. stuff so and as, but yeah I mean you know nothing wrong with oh, it yeah. really and as I had mentioned before. My wife Wendy and I, we, we play Ascension a lot. Uh, we definitely get it out. Yeah, so you need that variation. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess. And, and this is going to be nice. It's going to be a welcome change. Actually, since Storm of Souls came out, I don't think we've broken out the original sets yeah. at all. So this is going to be I, a welcome addition. And I, I'm still not sure if we're going to mix it. Because we mixed the well, first that's, two. That's the other problem with, that's why I like the iOS implementation now. And, because uh, I just click a little button. Well, no, I'm not talking about shuffling or anything. Because no, no, that's what I mean. I mean mixing different sets together. If I want to play with these three mixed together, I can press a button. They're mixed together. If I want to play only with this base set, I can uncheck the other ones, and now I've got this base set. I don't have to fish all the cards out with a certain matching symbol and and spend thirty bucks on sleeves. <laughs> you know, or at that point you just buy another copy, right? Just like the race for the galaxy crew. I just realized I need uh, sleeves. Oh boy. Yeah. There you go. There we go. Up. Well you got a custom little dice bag or what not dice yeah, it's like a little gem yeah, the, bag, I guess you would call it. Uh the the points in there oh, what are they called? Honor points or something like that. They got those little plastic gems. Wait, how many times have you played Ascension and you don't know off the top of your head? I call them points. <laughs> <laughs> That's the I theme got, failing for I got you right there when you, when you can't remember what they're called. <laughs> Jewels. Little, little gems. Well, so I was disappointed in, in this category that I didn't find something that for me was surprisingly good because there was too many of these at Gen Con this year. There were deck builders and collectible card games everywhere. Yes. Oh, for was, sure. I, I think there was 10 new Marvel ones alone. And I mean, there were so many that I, I just stopped even looking at them. Every, it seemed yeah. like every third booth was another new one. And, and, and uh, there's a couple I, of you know, big ones at the FFG booth too. Well, and you know, people I think expected Netrunner to be good. And we'll talk about our thoughts on that in the next show. And I think people expected Star Wars to be okay or good or I, I'm not sure. But you know, again, we'll, we, we got to play both of those, but I don't think either one was like surprisingly good where I, you know, I started out thinking they weren't going to be that great. And then came away thinking they were awesome. The, the one that I w- was hoping would would make it for me in this category, and uh, I think I talked about, I think I mentioned it to you, is I got this invite for the Transformers deck builder game. And I'm almost positive it was a deck builder, not a collectible card okay. game. Because if it was a collectible card game, I would have just clicked delete. And, uh, and so this was a, um, you know, for, for press only kind of invite, you know, go to the special room at the special time and get this. And, and it was one of those and I lost it. <laughs> and this was like the only one. And, I, you know, so many of those little things were all for CCGs and deck builders. And this was like the only one I even cared to like make any kind of extra effort to go see. Cause I, you know, I am kind of a Transformers fan and such, and it had really neat artwork and uh, I just don't know what I did with it. And, uh, I didn't see it. Not that I really you know, I, I probably ran when I saw CCGs, but I, I don't remember seeing it on the floor. And so I'll have to dig around and see. I'm sure someone else um, got to play it or try it or whatever. But 
um, I've got some hope for that because that sounds cool. You know, a transformer deck builder. And again, I would say it could be surprisingly good because I really wouldn't expect it. I mean, whatever company it was from wasn't one I think I'd heard of. I wouldn't really expect much of it. I would expect it to be kind of all art and trying to exploit the license and such. And so that if I played it and it actually turned out to be great, then that would be surprisingly good. So, um, but I didn't actually, that was one of the things I didn't get to play. So, right. Oops. Uh, but yeah, I think that kind of rounds out our top, most surprisingly good games of Gen Con 2012. Yes, it do. So, uh, definitely tune in for our next show where we'll go over many, many more of the, seemingly endless number of games we got played this year and we'll uh, give our thoughts on all of those all right thanks for joining us on episode 19 of this board game life gen con 2012 part one make sure to check out our website at thisboardgamelife.com and you can also reach us at contact at thisboardgamelife.com to you know share experiences on anything that you've uh, played that we've talked about on the show or any questions that you might have we would love to hear them you can also call our uh, voicemail at 754-444-TBGL which is 754-444-8245 we'd love for you to use that format to give us uh, feedback on the show or ask us a question that you think would make a great segment uh, also you can send us uh, an mp3 form instead of the voicemail Do check out our BGG Guild and join that. Subscribe if you'd like. Also, we have a BGG blog where you can comment on episodes and get updates there. And other than uh, our normal RSS feed that's found on our website, you can also find us on iTunes and Stitcher and a couple other venues or distribution methods, whatever you want to call them. And also make sure to rate us on iTunes. Please rate us five. Uh, stars so that uh, we can become featured and my name is rob i'll catch y'all later this episode was recorded on august 21st and august 22nd because we talked so long um you've been listening to this board game life there is no antidote for board gaming this is jeff till next time